everyone, and welcome to today's Global Management Lecture Series, uh, hosted by UCLA Anderson Center for Global Management, and it's sponsored by uh, the Applied Management Research Program and Net Impact. As part of the series, the Center for Global Management invites important and influential speakers from around the world to discuss critical issues that impact the global business economy um, and uh, global political economy, including social, social business. Today, we're delighted to welcome to UCLA Anderson, Mr. Rupert Schofield, President and CEO of Finca International, who will share the story of the evolution of Finca, um, from its beginnings as a small NGO in Latin America to transform into a global microfinance network, partnering with socially responsible investors to advance its mission. In telling the Finca story and sharing his personal journey, <coughs> Mr. Schofield will demonstrate the tangible, life-changing effects of increasing the flow of capital towards social good. The Foundation for International Community Assistance, or FINCA as it's better known, has been called the Poverty Vaccine for the Planet. Founded in 1984 by Rupert Schofield and John Hatch, it pioneered the village banking microcredit model that so many other organizations are following today, and has developed innovative partnerships to offer insurance protections and health care to its members. While FINCA's work is never done, Mr. Schofield's leadership over the past 19 years has led to growth in uh, growth from 60,000 clients and a loan portfolio of $5 million to a global <laughs> network serving almost 1 million low-income women and men across five continents with a loan portfolio of over $500 million. Rupert Schofield is an agricultural economist with two master's degrees, a BA from Brown, and 40 years of experience in developing countries, starting with his Peace Corps experience in Guatemala. In, in addition to actively managing Finca's operations, Mr. Schofield is a pioneer and leader in the social entrepreneurship movement, authoring the Social Entrepreneur's Handbook, participating in speaking engagements around the world, including at the Net Impact Conference a couple weeks ago, and keeping his fans in the loop on Twitter at, at Rupert Schofield. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in the privilege of welcoming the co-founder, president, and CEO of Finca, Mr. Rupert Schofield. <laughs> Thank you for the kind introduction, and Gonzalo. I feel kind of like that guy on Pacific Rim with all these wires. <coughs> Either that or maybe it's a polygraph, who knows. <coughs> so uh, really thrilled you could come out. Um, you know, some things haven't changed about, about uh, college students. And I notice one thing that is identical to when I went to Brown, like, 40 years ago or whatever is that the, all, these are always the last seats to fill in in the front. <laughs> you know, but don't worry, I'm not going to call on you. <coughs> or maybe I will, who knows. Anyway, so um, what I'd like to do is um, sort of describe how you know, I got into this line of work and then talk a bit about how uh, you know, Finca has evolved over the years. But I want to leave you know, plenty of time for you guys to have questions. And please, you know, don't hold back. We know the industry, microfinance, has problems. And you, if you're aware of that, then, you know, ask away. Because, uh, you know, uh, transparency, I think, is a key to any modern business, you know, recognizing its problems and confronting them straight on. Um, so anyway. Um, what does it take to start a social business? Well. You know, obviously an idea, uh, secondarily a plan, and I, and I would say in Finca, uh, you know, it was very secondary because we actually didn't do any planning until we'd been at it about 10 years, and we decided, hmm, it's going pretty well. Maybe it would do better if we did a plan. Uh, but in fact, when we did the plan, the plan, the conclusion of the plan was everybody go long. You know, just keep doing what you're doing. So. Anyway, as it got more complicated, you know, then we actually did have to do work on strategy. But so if, you're, if you want to get into the social enterprise space, uh, what, what is the most important thing? <coughs> and I'll illustrate this with my own journey. But to me, the most important thing is, you know, what do you really care about? You know, is there an issue in the world that affronts your sense of justice? You know? Like in, in this country, fortunately, you know, we, we have a pretty reasonably functioning legal system, but still, I mean, let's face it, you know, if you have money in this country, you, you get more justice. There's no question about it. And that's how the world is. 
Um, and so there's got to be probably some wrongs you would like to see redressed. And maybe you're the only person you know, who cares enough about that thing to actually say, damn it, I'm going to do something about it. <clears throat> um, so without further ado, I'm going to speak to my personal uh, experience, you know, how I found my passion when I was about your age. Um, and uh, I'm going to, you know, I, I was going to entitle this something modest like the hero's journey. Um, you know, especially since we're in L.A. I don't know if any of you are in show business, but my daughter is a screenwriter in London. And uh, she gave me this thing about the hero's journey. <coughs> you know, when you write a formulaic movie, you know, the hero, he's about to triumph and then he gets knocked on his ass, you know, and he gets back up, you know. And I thought, wow, that was me. So anyway, here it is. So um, I actually owe getting into this whole field to Richard Nixon. <coughs> now, uh, I hope you all remember who Richard Nixon was. Um, he was the president of the United States when I was at uni in my senior year. And uh, he put together a lot. He was, finding, he was having trouble getting people to volunteer for the Vietnam War because it was at the stage uh, which John Kerry, our current Secretary of State, described as nobody wanted to be the last man to die for a mistake. And we certainly felt that way in the liberal Northeast. Um, and so Nixon said, you know what, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll have a lottery and everybody who uh, gets their birthday drawn in the first hundred gets drafted and goes to Vietnam. So this was pretty exciting, you know. It was the spring of 1971. So we got together at the frat house, you know, with plenty of beer around the television. And one by one, those birthdays came out, you know, and some people, like, got hit with one or three or something. I made it to 67 before my birthday, July 25th, came out. Now, uh, they say that being the knowledge one will be hanged upon the morrow concentrates the mind wonderfully. I think that's Shakespeare, I'm not sure. But anyway, suddenly here I was, I was ending university. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I'd majored in psychology because I happened to get an A in psych one my freshman year. So I thought, okay, good. I can build on that, you know. <laughs> um, and so I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. And now suddenly, I was faced with some pretty stark choices. I could go to Vietnam, and I might survive, but I might be killed, and my journey would be over, and many of my friends sadly were killed. Uh, we won't go into that. But uh, the other thing I could do would be go to Canada. Um, now, I love Canadians. Are there any Canadians here? I love Canada, <clears throat> but I didn't want to live there <laughs> and leave my family. It's cold there, right? Um, so, okay, I could go to jail. And there were people, you know, who had that moral, you know, courage or whatever, and they went to jail rather than serve. So I said, okay, none of those sounds great. What else could there be? So I learned, somebody said, hey, why don't you try the Peace Corps, you know? I said, what's that? They said, oh, you go to some, you know, under, what do we call them then, underdeveloped or third world country. You go to some third world country and you live in a shack and you get amoebas and, you know, and then you come back, you know, and it's only two years. So I thought, two years, yeah, maybe anything could happen, you know. So I checked it out and uh, they checked me out and they said, yeah, we think you'll do Schofield. Where would you like to go? And I thought a minute. Jamaica? I said, no, no, forget it. No, we're going to send you to Guatemala, and you're going to be attached to an agricultural cooperative, and you're going to help small farmers in Guatemala grow corn and beans. And I looked at him, I said, you do realize uh, I was born in New York, right? And they said, don't worry about it, you know, we'll teach you all that stuff. So uh, they were as good as their word. I learned to speak Spanish in Mexico for two two months training, and then I had two months growing corn and beans uh, without much success in Costa Rica. Then off I go to, uh, to Guatemala, and I'm in this beautiful, idyllic, tropical town in the highlands, you know, uh, 
banana trees everywhere, uh, corn, you know, any crop in the world would grow there. Soil very fertile uh, and, you know, volcanoes, panorama and everything. <clears throat> uh, and I started to go meet the farmers and I quickly realized I would be more of a threat to their crops than a benefit. So, uh, so what can I do here to be useful? Well, I, I noticed, you know, they'd, while they were skilled farmers, the land that they had been cultivating generation after generation was depleted of all its minerals by now. And, the, you know, the yields were getting smaller and smaller. And, and so uh, I said, well, why don't we, uh, you know, give them some fertilizer? Well, they don't have any money. All right, well, let's finance it, you know. So we came up with a scheme to make $50 loans in the form of fertilizer to these impoverished peasant farmers. Now, these guys were living in conditions that, you know, really pissed off somebody, you know, who had any sense of justice, you know, in society. I mean, they were just cruelly exploited. They were treated like animals, really, or even less well than animals. You know, the animals got vaccines and were well fed. But these people were virtual slaves. Uh, on these big plantations and they packed them up in trucks and sent them down to the coast to harvest sugar cane or uh, cotton, you know. And they, they, and where we came in was they let them have a little plot of land, like a half an acre that they could grow corn and beans on. And that was how they were supposed to subsist. So they were, you know, they were starving to death, many of them. So anyway, we organized this uh, cooperative with them and we decided we'd make them $50 loans so they could, uh, you know, fertilize their land. And it, uh, it worked beautifully. Uh, their crops, you know, doubled and tripled. They uh, were able to feed their families, uh, you know, and they had a marketable surplus that they could use to buy medicine and so forth. Uh, and the other thing I noticed was they began to repay the loans like the first week that uh, we delivered the fertilizer. They would come to market day, and they would knock on my house, and I had this little adobe shack, and I had a little table I had built. And uh, they would come in and they'd say, here's 50 centavos, Don Ruperto, here's 10 cents, you know? And, you know, just to, for my own security, I kept an old rusting 45 on the desk, so the word would get out, you know, hey, the gringos, I knew the word would get out, the gringos taking money. So I wanted the word to get out also, he's taking money, but he's got a gun, you know? <laughs> so anyway, um, by the time the, uh, now I had checked out, I had 800 of these clients, and I didn't know crap about credit, even though my father was a, a banker, you know? My father would get up on Long Island uh, and go into the city every day into Wall Street in his gray jacket, you know, and come back late at night. And I'd be thinking, God, I'm never going to be a banker, you know, never. He's laughing up there now. I can hear him. But um, so, uh, you know, uh, I had, uh, you know, just sort of out of instinct, I said, OK, I've got a list of the 800 co-op members. Now, why don't I just walk around town? Maybe somebody knows them. Maybe some of them aren't, you know, have defaulted on loans before. So I take the thing around. and. Everybody says, they're all good except this guy, you know, Apollinario Atz. Uh, he owes money to everybody in town. So I went down to the director of the co-op, and I said, they're all good except Apollinario. I said, okay, good work, Schofield. I'll go back, you know, to your site. Well, when it times to deliver the, comes to deliver the fertilizer, there's Apollinario in the front of the line. I said, how did you get approved for a loan? He said, oh, I just told your boss, you know, that this crazy gringo didn't like me for some reason and he overruled you. So anyway, uh, at the end of the loan cycle, sure enough, everybody repays in full except the Polinario. And I'm still looking for him. If you guys run into him on social media or something, I think he owes me like a hundred million dollars now with interest. <laughs> but um, Anyway, so, wow, that was, uh, that was a pretty neat experience, you know? I mean, here was something that was really cheap foreign aid. It went right to the poor people, and it had an impact, and it was sustainable. My God, it, we didn't give them the money. We could have, but they paid us back. You know, they, we charged 12% interest a year, 1% a month. And um, so, anyway, comes time to go. Uh, 
just as I had hoped. Uh, Nixon ended the draft before I had to leave. Um, so I thought, wow, I, I really did win this lottery this time. Um, so it comes time to go. So I start going around, you know, to say goodbye to everybody. And I was just stunned by their reaction. You know, they, they said, what? You're leaving? No, Don Ruperto, you can't leave. No. And some of them grabbed my hand like they were trying to physically restrain me. And I thought, wow, you know, for the first time in my life, I had made a difference in someone else's, you know. So, whew, wow. Anyway, I knew I'd get over it, you know. I didn't, I just had to go back to New York, <laughs> and, you know, get that out of my head. So, uh, I went back to New York, and, um, you know, it was just a wonderful time to be looking for a job. This may sound familiar. Uh, there was a, you know, recession going on. It was the time of the first, quote, oil crisis where, uh, o the OPEC cartel got together and they quadrupled the price of oil and hence of gasoline. Remember? Well, you probably don't remember that. Um, but, you know, thank God we learned our lesson, you know, and today, 40 years later, we're independent of hydrocarbons. Isn't it great? Isn't it wonderful? You know? But anyway, so uh, nobody's hiring. You know, I interview, you know, walking around Manhattan and, uh, you know, um, but basically people look at me, oh, okay, the Peace Corps, right. Yeah, all right, well, you know, maybe you ought to try over here. I remember I, I, I interviewed with this ad agency, you know, and this guy said, well, let me excite you about advertising. He said, you know, we invented a toothpaste the other day. He said, what does a toothpaste need to do? Well, it needs to give you a white smile, breath smell good, and we invented a toothpaste. And then he muttered under his breath, and the world had another toothpaste it didn't need. And he looked at me and said, maybe this turns you just right off, you know? I said, yeah, it does. <laughs> I'm out of here. So anyway, but then, you know, reality started to bite. Uh, money, you know, the Peace Corps gave me a few thousand bucks to transition out. Uh, that was all gone. So living in a little apartment in Brooklyn and, uh, you know, I said, what can I do? I must have some marketable skill. The only thing I can do is speak Spanish. So I start calling up tutoring agencies. And this guy says, yeah, I have a tutoring agency. I also have a vocational school. Brown, huh? Yeah, why don't you come down? Let's talk. And so he talks to me. He says, OK, I've got a situation. I've got somebody who's running a school for hairdressers, the Wilfred Beauty Academy. And there's a whole bunch of Hispanic students there who, uh, if they could get a high school diploma, then they <coughs> could get uh, financial aid and he could quadruple the tuition he charges them. So I, so, and so they need somebody to, you know, teach them, tutor them to pass, you know, mathematics and Spanish, you know, and so sort of grammar. And I thought, this sounds like a very ethical situation. I'm in, you know. <laughs> so, um, so I started out with a class of about 30 and over time, you know, lots of enthusiasm, and over time it whittled down to two, and the two took the test and plunked. <coughs> so I was fired. So then I said, well, the guy said, okay, well, try the vocational school, you know. I said, well, what's the, I didn't say what's the value proposition, but I, I said, so what's the deal here? He said, well, um, you know, you just call, cold call all these young women who are about to uh, graduate high school, and uh, you talk them into coming to learn to be a medical secretary or a lab technician or a medical something other else. I can't remember what it was. <coughs> and I said, okay, well, let me try it, you know. So I call up this uh, young woman in uh, an affluent suburb of New Jersey and I say, oh, Carol, I hear you're graduating. Congratulations. What are you going to do after you graduate? Oh, I'm going to Harvard. I'm into pre-med. I say, okay, and the guy goes, wait, wait, and he grabs the phone. Susie, wouldn't you rather be, come to my vocational school and become a medical secretary and you'll marry a rich doctor? You know, and so I'm thinking, I think that model may have worked back in the 50s, you know, but this is like <laughs> 75. So anyway, you guessed it, no sales. Uh, my last sales gig, I'm going, in, I'm going physically in front of a school, career day. 
and I show this lame movie from the vacational school, you know. I can still remember the, what will you do when you're finally on your own, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and so I give the pitch, right? And the people just look at me blankly, you know, like, what are you trying to sell us, you know? And I literally just broke down. I started weeping. And uh, so the teacher came up to me. And she said, you were in the Peace Corps, weren't you? And I said, yeah. And she said, why don't you tell them about the Peace Corps, you know? So I started talking about my experience. And the old excitement came back, you know? And I realized, that's what I have to do. So. Let's send the uh, hero on the next phase of his journey. <coughs> okay, you're, get, you're recognizing the rhythm here now? Down, up. Okay, um, so uh, I decide, all right, I got to get back into this development stuff. So I uh, applied to Princeton and Johns Hopkins and Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, I didn't get into... Princeton or Hopkins, but I always wanted to go to Wisconsin. <coughs> and, you know, once again, fate intervened. So off I went, and I got two, ma well, you already heard the bio, two masters in two years, no thesis. You know, I just wanted to get my paper and get back to work. And uh, so I start interviewing, you know, and uh, now I had these degrees, so I had more cred. Uh, <laughs> And I got to each, you know, interview, I'd get like, sometimes it would be between me and one other person, you know, and they'd say, so Schofield, you know, are you excited about coming to work here, you know? And here would be like a farm equipment company or a ag chemical company or the Bank for Cooperatives in St. Paul, a little closer, state government of Madison. And I'd go, oh no. I can't do this. So anyway, baby is on the way, no job, student loans to pay. I'm trudging through the student union, you know, disconsolate. And I happen to look up, uh, you know, at the bulletin board and I see this ad. It says, um, looking for ex-Peace Corps volunteers who speak Spanish and can write to join consulting firm. Uh, he's looking for me. Said, I mean, okay, consulting? I don't know anything. What am I going to consult on? Now, that was before I knew the model of consulting firms. <laughs> Take somebody who knows nothing, bill them out at 4000 a day. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, I go, what have I got to lose? So take the CV, stick it in an envelope. Send it off to this guy, John Hatch. You know, I know nothing's going to happen. Week later, I get back a letter. I open it up. A check falls out for $1,500, made out to me, and a plane ticket to the Dominican Republic, <coughs> and then a yellow post-it, you're hired, meet me in Santo Domingo. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> Who is this? Who is this Hatch madman? So anyway, I went off to the Dominican Republic, John and I hit it off, you know, incredibly well. Um, we didn't actually get together to form Finca. There was some intervening adventures, lovingly chronicled in my book, if you're interested. Um, but we did get back together in 84, and we launched Finca. Um, and the one thing I can absolutely tell you, if you're thinking about starting a business, if you have a powerful idea that really works, that's going to carry you through a lot of screw-ups, you know? I mean, you can do almost everything wrong, but if you have an idea that really works, uh, and for us, it was this village banking, this is actually, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion, who invented microfinance, you know? Was it Eunice? Was it Oxion? Does it go back to the Stone Age? Anyway, this, this drawing was taken from the walls of the caves of Lascaux in, in the Dordogne region of France. Radiocarbon dated at 12,000 years. So it just puts to rest the entire you know, argument. Um, but you know, it was dead simple, which you know, the most beautiful things I think are simple. You know, and 
we would get into explaining this to the women and we'd get to like the house and they'd all be nodding. Yeah, yeah, we get it. Can we have the money now? And, uh, you know, it was just simple. We'd just put money in the communities as a loan and we told the women, invest in whatever you think you can make money uh, and you have to pay us back, you know, with interest. We charge 3% a month. Uh, but, you know, most of the credit available back then was at 10% a day. So that was part of the reason this worked so incredibly well, you know, back in what I call the epoch door of, of uh, microfinance when there was no competition, you know, and credit was so scarce. Whoever could get a hold of credit could just work that and make, you know, a really robust return. And so, um, you know, it worked brilliantly. And we went, uh, another part of our, of our model was that, you know, we didn't use our own money because we had none. Well, we had a little money from our consulting firm, you know, but it was not as yet Deloitte, you know, or Price Waterhouse. It was Fink, it was not Fink, yeah. We call it Rural Development Services. You've all heard of that, right? That was a <laughs> huge success story in the consulting world. Um, so. Uh, we, you know, we primed it with the profits as such as they were, but that was not enough to do anything, you know, broad or deep. So John had the great idea, well, we're consultants, let's go to CARE, let's go to Save the Children, let's go to Plan International. They have money and uh, we'll train them in this dynamite intervention and, uh, you know, they can prove it for us. And it'll be even more convincing because it's not us saying, hey, this is great, we'll have all these people. It was ingenious, really. Um, John was a genius. I didn't say a practical genius, um, but he really, uh, you know, he just intuitively knew these things. Um, now, there was only one drawback to this approach, which became evident uh, pretty early in the process. We would go, you know, train the people uh, the uh, employees of the other NGOs, they would go out, they'd do the village banks, they'd, you know, we'd go the second visit, they'd go, wow, this is amazing, it's just working incredibly well, you know, the women are all paying us back, and, you know, they're, they're building these assets and everything, this is amazing. And then we go the third time, and they'd say, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, we know how to do this already, we don't need you, thanks for coming, but, you know, when's your plane leave, you know? And John, John would go, great, you know, this is great. And uh, after we'd leave, I'd say, John, this is not great. You know, we, we are going to be out of work pretty soon. You know? um, I said, why don't we trade for our own, uh, our own account? And so we had big arguments, you know, in our small little board. Should we keep doing what we're doing or should we, you know, put our own brand on it? And fortunately, I prevailed and we said, all right, let's, let's take a a big leap here. Let's invest 10 grand in each of four countries of Central America. And we'll find, uh, you know, a social entrepreneur who will work for nothing, you know, $500 a month, and we'll put this methodology in their hands and we'll train them and whoosh, off they go. So um, it worked incredibly, whether we picked the right people or what, who knows, but, you know, they would do their four pilots in each country and they would bring donors to it and the donors would go, wow, this is amazing. Here, have a million dollars. And so, uh, you know, pretty soon we had four uh, programs in Central America that were growing and had, you know, instead of just hundreds of clients, thousands of clients. So we were off. And, uh, you know, in those days it seemed like we just couldn't do anything wrong. <coughs> um, so we built out a number of countries in Latin America, chiefly Central America. I remember I went to Ecuador. Not, I didn't have any grant money. I went with a, a, a I went with fifty thousand dollars in borrowed capital that some doctor in Washington D.C. lent to me. You know, and I just went to Ecuador, and I, you know, I had to contact some friend of some friend, a professor from Ohio University. And he introduced me to one person, and we threw together a board. And uh, with $50,000 of borrowed money, we just started the program. And again, it worked in Ecuador. So uh, again, that's the power 
of this idea. You can actually get away with stuff like that, and it will work. So we, uh, you know, we'd been working in Latin America for a decade. It was working well. So one day I get a call from this woman in Minnesota, and she says, uh, hey, uh, we have a friend from Uganda, and he says, uh, you know, that he's heard about Finca, and he thinks it would be perfect for his village in Uganda. You know, what would it take you to go to Uganda, you know? Now, by now, I was sophisticated, you know? And, you know, in the old days, I would have said, well, pay half my plane ticket, I'm, and I'm there, you know? Now I thought, okay, no, no, Rupert, think you get some real money, you know? I said, well, it'd be like, geez, we'd need a hundred grand to do that. Africa's like pretty far away. And she said, oh. Uh, and I thought, okay, that's the last I'll hear from her. She said, all right. And she hangs up. Two months later, she says, okay, I got the money. When can you go? And I was like, well, off I go to Africa. And in two weeks, we uh, organized an NGO, Finca Uganda. We opened a bank account. I trained a credit officer. I hired a president uh, or a CEO to supervise the one credit officer. Um, <laughs> and then I left. I left. And uh, I didn't come back for four months. I mean, uh, so I come back in four months. I'm thinking, God, what, what am I going to find? Have they just run off with the money, you know? And I come back to the village. Well, I, I actually, I should have described when I when we went to this one bank in Kimantu village, which was the first one, it's a beautiful place, you know, near the source of the Nile, uh, but pretty remote. And I described to the women, you know, I have like a schoolhouse full of about 40 women. I'm, you know, just have that little drawing up there from the caves of Lascaux, and I'm describing to them how it works. And, but they aren't nodding or smiling. They're, look, they're looking like scared, you know. And one of them, you know, reluctantly raises her hand and says, how much are you going to lend us? I said, 50,000 shillings, which was $50. And she went, oh, you know, oh, God, I couldn't borrow that, you know? And uh, I said, well, look, you don't have to, you know? Borrow 10, 20, whatever. Okay, so she said, I'll borrow 20, you know? And so anyway, now I come back four months later. And the place is transformed. The women are smiling, you know. Uh, I talked to the same woman, you know, and I say, so how is this working for you? And, and she says, well, it's fine, but uh, I have just one complaint. I said, what's that? She said, 50 is not enough. I need like $200, you know. And another one says, I, I asked her, so what is the change that you've experienced uh, as a result of this Finca Village Bank, and she said, well, the skin on my knees is smooth now. I said, yeah, okay, I'm not putting that together. Um, and she said, well, before Finca came, if I needed money to buy salt, I had to crawl across the dirt floor of our dwelling and beg my husband, you know, to give me money to buy salt. But now he has to crawl across the floor <laughs> and beg me for money to buy beer, you know. And so, uh, wow, you know, it was amazing. And I, and I have to say, you know, just I went back to that same village bank in Kimantu. I had not been uh, in 20 years, but we had our 20th anniversary uh, just last year. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't give my team time to prepare because I knew they'd put on a show. So I only gave them like a week's notice. I said, I'm coming to Uganda and I want to go out there and talk to those women. And of course, I'm praying, geez, I hope something's still there, you know. And so, uh, you know, we come up to the village, and even though I'd only give them an, a week, they had, of course, prepared a show, you know, so the women are dancing and everything. And uh, a number of them had died, you know, but uh, one of them I talked to, her, and her story was pretty typical. She said, that $50 you gave us back then transformed my life. She said, now I have you know, a, clo a youth closing biz business in seven towns in the area. I get around on my motorcycle. You know, I built a house. I have five acres of sugar cane, you know, that I sell to the, to the plant here. And my daughter's finished uh, university. And she said, and that was all built on that $50, you know. But wow. Um, anyway. Um, 
I think we need to get to some of the other stuff. So I'll skip the Eurasia story, uh, which is um, amazing in its own way. Uh, when we went to Kyrgyzstan and then the Middle East and Afghanistan. And our most two recent markets are, uh, we bought a bank in Pakistan and we bought a bank in, in Nigeria. Why? Well, these are countries that are still very underserved by microfinance. Uh, they have each populations of north of 180 million people, very high levels of poverty. Um, so we are, uh, you know, we're continuing to sort of go to markets where, you know, most people in their right minds would say, no, that's crazy. How are we doing on time? Ooh, uh, geez, I'm talking too much. You know what, I'm gonna blaze through this because this is kind of textbook stuff because I really want to get to some questions and hear what you guys are interested about. But, you know, innovation has been, you know, a watchword of ours. We believe in failing frequently and cheaply. You know, try stuff in pilots uh, before you try to roll it out over the whole thing. I think that's pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, what we're doing now because we're in a different environment. You know, now there are a lot of markets where there's too much microfinance and clients are getting over indebted. You know, Mexico is a, is a we did a study in Mexico and a court, only a, a quarter, one in four of the people who apply for a loan to Finca Mexico don't already have other loans. And three of them, uh, sorry, and, uh, and I think 33% of them have three or more, you know, so, uh, credit, uh, and this is, you know, this is a product of the success of the industry, but credit is not scarce, uh, which is the good news, but the bad news is it's not as powerful, it's not as transformative as it used to be, you know, when people couldn't start microenterprises, and, you know, if you were selling tomatoes in the market, you were one of 15 people versus now when you're one of 500. You know, and those margins are, are not the same. So what, what do you do if you are uh, trying to have an impact on poverty? Um, I think, you know, you look at other areas. You look at how can you help the poor be less vulnerable, you know? Get in, uh, what, what knocks poor people off the ladder out of poverty more often than anything, of course, is, is health. So, you know, we're, we're doing an intervention in green energy. Uh, a renewable source of, of light and power for households uh, in Uganda, which has like three benefits. One, it replaces kerosene, which is very harmful to people's health. Two, the primary thing is it allows the kids to do their homework at school uh, uh, after, after dark in the house. Um, and uh, there was another thing, oh, and it also, uh, you know, gives people an added uh, source of income if they decide to be someone who's going to sell this uh, product in their community. So lots of interesting stuff. Um, the financial model, let's do that another time. Um, so we'll go right to questions. So go ahead, ask me anything. I have nothing to hide. <coughs> Yeah. So, um, in terms of communities that maybe are more high risk or over indebted, have you considered maybe? I, I noticed you um, uh, had on one of the slides Islamic loans. Mm -hmm. Have you considered maybe? Uh, I'm assuming that those loans are more typically for Islamic communities. Have you thought about providing that same sort of structure in either over indebted areas or maybe I guess high risk or areas that just uh, don't have a high likelihood of repaying? Yeah. No. Uh, we're. What you're talking about is a kind of a, well, there's two things. One is maybe a kind of a micro equity, which is basically what Islamic, I've always been fascinated by that, you know, because I think, you know, I mean, a loan is a, I mean, I did it in Ecuador, we did it in Ecuador, started a program with a loan, but it's a crummy way to start a business, you know, if you can, if you can avoid it. The best way is have some equity and have some time to get income streams going before the, investors start knocking you know, on your door for the dividends. Uh, we're also, frankly, giving away money <coughs> in some of our pilots. Uh, one of our 
our, one of our programs in Mexico, we held a contest. We said, we want you to, uh, for our 10,000 employees, we said, we want you to come up with creative ideas to how to reach really poor, destitute people, because credit doesn't work that, you know, at that level. It used to, uh, but it doesn't anymore. Um, so uh, we got 400 different ideas back, and one of them was from Mexico, and they said, we're going to go to each of our village banks and we're going to challenge them to identify the poorest, most destitute family in their community. And we're going to supply them with four months of food, you know, so they can get back on their feet. And during those four months, we want you guys to mentor, you know, the head of the household, usually the woman, and to what kind of business she might do four months from now, you know, if she joined your village bank and, and got a loan. You know, we, we don't know the results yet, but, um, you know, we're going to experiment with it. Yeah. You talk about how innovation and um, lack of aversion to failure has been the core of your success. Can you maybe share with us a pilot project that failed or didn't succeed as well as you thought and how you adapted it? I've never failed. <laughs> no. Um, Geez, a failure. Wow, where do I begin? <laughs> I mean, the, big, the biggest failure, you know, and when I, when I took over as CEO in 94, <clears throat> we had three programs blow sky high. We had a million dollar fraud in El Salvador. We had our program in, in Guatemala where I just persuaded a billionaire from Seattle to give us a million dollars. Uh, we had an audit that discovered wrongdoing by our CEO, and when we tried to intervene, she just uh, hijacked the whole program because I stupidly structured it in a very dumb, naive way. We put in all the money, but uh, she had all the control. She handpicked her board and everything. I've seen a lot of startups, you know, because this is boring stuff. This is lawyers. This is accountants. No offense to any lawyers or accountants. <laughs> But you're boring. No, no. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you know, if if you're an entrepreneur, it's the creation that excites you, right? It's testing your idea. It's seeing it, you know, whether it's people are going to buy it. It's not protecting yourself against maybe maybe even your partners. You know, I mean, your partners may see a way to get control of this company and they see you're kind of like a naive kind of inventor type and you don't have a head for that stuff but you have to do it you know you really have to uh, and uh, and my my CEO he was out of out of a fortune 500 company he was actually John Hatch's brother older smarter brother in terms of business and for some reason he let us fail you know, he just watched us stumbling. You know, he knew what was going to happen. And then when everything collapsed, I was sure I was going to be fired. I mean, I, I had Mexico blew up, Salvador, Guatemala. Between them, probably we lost $5 million. And this was when, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. And I don't know to this day why I didn't get fired. I can only think that, you know, he, he saw it as a good learning experience. Is that the kind of failure? Are you happy now? <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. Yeah, there you go. Can you talk a little bit more about the Clean Energy Initiative mm. in Uganda? Yeah. Um, was anybody at my thing at Net in Impact? How many of you? Oh, good. I was worried about that because I thought, oh, they're going to be bored stiff because I kind of did the hero's journey there. No, we had, we had a session at Net Impact on this green energy. And uh, we are at the point where, you know, we, we had about five uh, failed pilots, you know, on a small scale. One was the problem was the product. The second was the maintenance, you know. Uh, eventually, we got a good partner. We're partnering with Barefoot Power. The product is good. Uh, we sold about 1,800 units so far this year, uh, and now we're ready to scale. And we've raised some donated money from Ford Foundation and a few others. Um, but, you know, uh, the reason I enjoyed the session at Net Impact, I challenged them. Said, oh, I challenged them. I said, okay, here's where we are. You know, the, the thing works. 
uh, there is a demand for it. Uh, I, know, uh, I know that they're selling, Grameen Bank's selling like a thousand of these or similar units every day. Um, so, uh, you know, and they're reaching about 1% of the population, I guess, at this point. Um, so, and the value proposition is clear, clear, clear. You know, save money on fuel, you know, all this other stuff. It's, so, it's sales, it's distribution. So, I said, how, how are we going to scale this, you know? And they were great. You know, they asked me a whole bunch of questions I couldn't answer. Fortunately, I had thought ahead, so I, I had a uh, helpline back to my office, you know, the person who's running the project, so she helped me answer a bunch of the questions. But, um, you know, we have to figure out the pricing, we have to figure out the distribution, uh, but I think there's, there's a lot of potential in this stuff. I mean, green energy is just, uh, you know, it's a no-brainer for Africa and for, you know, all the, all the southern hemisphere. So, uh, you know, it, to me it's exciting because I'm really seeing a lot of product interventions that actually work, you know, in green energy and health and water. I mean, if they'd had the water filters that are out today when I was in the Peace Corps, I wouldn't have been carried off to the hospital, like, and almost died of dehydration. <laughs> um, they really work, you know, and so I'm thinking, what I'd like to do is put together a package, call it, say, a family welfare or well-being, let's not use welfare, family well-being package, you know, that has a health intervention, a water intervention, a green energy, you know, and see if we can figure out how to, uh, you know, make this thing affordable because, you know, they, we can't ever forget, you know, these people are the poorest people on earth and they don't have a lot of money, you know, and so, you know, if they're going to make a decision between buying this thing and eating, that's not going to work. They have to eat. So we have to figure out how to make it affordable. You know, it was when I was marketing my, my book to people like you, you know, I'd say, okay, uh, McGraw-Hill priced this at like $28. Now that's about the price of a 30 pack of Coors Light, you know? I mean, they're not, it's not going to work, you know? Anyway, I haven't figured that out. <laughs> anyway, yeah? Um, there's been a, a fair amount of documentation of aid organizations that have inadvertently created some type of, you know, disruptive economic issues that have done more harm than good. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, you know, try to avoid doing that? That's, that's a great question. And actually, when I was at Net Impact, we had, I think they called it a salon, you know. And, cause I, and, and I put that question to the people. I said, look, are we, as social entrepreneurs, are we just kind of helping to sustain governments that are, you know, uh, not doing what we're doing, but should be, you know? Like, we're, we're trying to do interventions in health and education and and so forth. Uh, these are supposed to be public goods, you know, in, in a, what I would call a reasonable society, which, you know, present society accepted because we don't believe in universal health care, apparently. Um, but, you know, in a reasonable society, I think, you know, um, these things, a lot of these services would be provided by the government. So we go in there with our enthusiasm and, you know, we work with the people and everything. Are we just sort of allowing, you know, these, let's call them unresponsive uh, governments who are, you know, spending money on, you know, weapons or shipping it off to, you know, Switzerland or whatever, instead of investing in their own society? Um, so that wasn't really your question. Um, but, uh, you know, when you get to be in my position, you learn how to spin it and answer <laughs> what you wanted. So did, have we done any harm? I'm trying to think. I guess what's... For example, um, say creating you know, inflation in a small community where you then you, know, you infuse all of this cash, they have more money, but then uh, you know, their debt levels go up and prices go up. Yeah, I, I would say if, if there is harm being done by microfinance, Finca included, and I hope in our case it's, it's not deliberate. Uh, certainly we've, we've sent a message, you know, our job is to protect clients, not over-indebt them. But, you know, 
Uh, we have a million clients and we have 10,000 employees. So I can't stand here and say every one of them is doing as, as they've been trained to do and supposed to do. And uh, yeah, there is, there is definitely an over indebtedness problem in a lot of countries. Now I've told our people in Mexico, look, growth is off the table. You know, I don't want to grow, you know, until we figure out how serious this problem is. So just, you know, work on, you know, serving your existing clients and, uh, and make doubly sure that you're checking with the credit bureaus and finding out how many, you know, existing loans they have. And, uh, you know, in some, in some cases like Kyrgyzstan, the government's actually helping us out. They said, if you give more than one loan, then you have to provision like 25%, you know? So there's a big economic financial disincentive which hits your bottom line directly, you know? But um, yeah, you know, we, uh, working with really poor people is a big responsibility and you can't behave just like any business that's just trying to maximize profits. That's my belief anyway. I mean, I think, you know, we, we have to be really responsible. Yeah. So you mentioned that now because of this, a lot of microfinance companies and um, people starting their own micro businesses, is there anything you were thinking of doing or is there anything other people can do to now help with job creation? So not just like giving money to somebody and having them start their business, but how do you actually make sure that they're successful in that? Mm -hmm. um, or if they don't start their business, is there something else that a microcredit can help them with in terms of? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and let's, I've al I have always been clear, you know, what we are doing with microfinance is helping people survive, you know. I mean, that's, that's pretty much uh, the main job until they can get a job in the formal sector uh, or, you know, an, a small percentage of them become fantastically successful because they really do have what it takes to, you know, build a business. Uh, we had a client from Uganda who's just phenomenal. I mean, I spoke with her in, in Edinburgh at a social enterprise conference. You know, she, she went from burning garbage in the markets and raking out the charcoal uh, to sell it in, in 2000 to now she flies to Dubai once a month and buys four container loads of cloth and, you know, sells it and she's got five acres of farm, you know, but that's a, that's a rare story, you know. For most people, uh, you know, I think we need to get into these areas of like, okay, you know, what can we do in agriculture, for example? You know, how can we get big companies that handle processing and marketing uh, on a global level to work with our small producers, you know, and find crops that are higher value crops, you know. And so there's a lot, a lot of people are working in this space now. They call it the value chain space. And I think, you know, we're at the early stages, so there's going to be a lot of failure and a lot of experimentation, but that's fine, you know. I think, I think uh, now that we're kind of focused on it, you know, this is the next big challenge, you know, to come up with social enterprises that can uh, really, you know, open up higher value added employment for, for poor people. Thanks. <clears throat>